What's up, guys, and welcome to One Take. Tonight, we're talking about Devs, Episode 3. And this is going to be full of spoilers, so if you haven't seen the episode yet, watch it and then check out this video. I'm Gil, and I'm here with my brother, Alun. Yo! And let's jump into tonight's episode. So first off, Alun, after Episode 1, we said we love this show. After Episode 2, we said, you know, we like it. A couple of small quibbles. After episode three, how are you feeling about devs? I still like it a little less than episode two. Yeah. How yeah. about you? I agree. I think Alex Garland is a filmmaker. This is the first TV series he's done. And I think this was the first episode that shows us he hasn't quite nailed down the pace of a TV series. Because the first two episodes, I thought, did a great job of both progressing the plot that we really care about, what's happening in the box, what is the big conspiracy, and telling us a little bit more about the characters. I thought this episode pretty much did neither. It felt more like a mechanical just progressing the plot from point A to point B, but I didn't find it very interesting overall. And by the end of the episode, I sort of felt like, the big revelation was that the video security footage of Sergey burning himself alive was fake. We already knew. We yeah. didn't know exactly the mechanics, but we knew it was fake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't know that it was going to be as simple as just some visual effects, though. We thought right. maybe there was some more science fiction-y explanation behind it. Exactly. But conceptually, we knew that's not... It was almost like Alex Garland forgot. He's like, oh, we showed in the previous episode how they strangled him and killed him. It was almost like they forgot that we as an audience knew how he was killed. So it felt like, by the end of the episode, I was kind of like, why did I just watch that? This didn't really feel like a very necessary episode. Having said that, there were still some things I really enjoyed, and overall, I'm still pretty captivated by where the series is going. So I thought we could start with a part of the episode where I have a lot of good things to say before we dive into the parts that I have some stuff to complain about. So at the beginning of the episode, we're back in the box. We have kind of a montage where we see different footage on that screen that can look into the past. We see the pyramids. We see another crucifixion. We see witches burning. And there's some talking too, which sounded super creepy. And we actually see Lily in the window where she put up the FU sign in the previous episode. So for me... We also yeah. saw Sergei being murdered. Oh, that's right. I saw a mouth, and I was like, what the hell is that? Yeah, and assuming that um, Stuart and the the kid were watching that, they didn't seem uh, <laughs> at all flabbergasted by it, assuming they knew what was going on. Right, and we don't know for sure they were the ones watching mm -hmm. it. it. After that montage, it cuts to them watching other stuff, which we'll get to. <laughs> so it may or may not have been them uh, that were watching all that stuff. But this is the part of the show that still has me super captivated. I feel like I'm actually seeing the past when they showed that stuff. And I'm super excited to see what are they going to show us next. We saw a crucifixion last episode. This episode I saw the pyramids. I was wondering if maybe we were going to see a dinosaur or two. Yeah, it, yeah and, the, and the, the score that they have going over the footage just again makes it feel super interesting and it's just awesome. I love that stuff. Yeah, I love the vibe of it, too. Kind of wish they'd focus a little more on this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Definitely this episode, all that stuff played a smaller role. Um, so we mentioned before, then we cut to Stuart and the other person in the room watching uh, Marilyn Monroe and her husband at the time, Arthur Miller, together in bed. You know, Which I think is exactly what Stuart would use it for. <laughs> <laughs> along with this kid right and uh, a few <laughs> other revelations in this scene when Katie walks in and tells them to stop watching this stuff she says we only have two rules we don't look forward we only look back and we don't invade privacy uh, also an important note there she says it's not powerful enough to predict that far back in time and uh, then lastly, at another important point in that scene, Stuart says, don't break the rules. Coming from her, implying that Katie is one to break the rules. So a few things to pick apart there. 
Number one, they say we don't look forward, we only look back. Why do you think that is? Maybe by looking forward, they alter the the tram lines. Right. If you know what's going to happen in the future, that affects the future, and maybe that's a big no-no. That, that was kind of where my thought went immediately. And then, why not invade privacy? That just feels like a really odd line to draw, considering their overall lack of consideration for humanity and their willingness to murder people. Yeah, a lot of people in this show seem like real hypocrites so far. Yeah, which... At first, I would say that makes them really interesting, and I want to know more about their character. I hope it's not just bad writing. <laughs> you know, I hope that it's not. I mean, human beings constantly contradict themselves, but this seems to be a very significant contradiction, at least for Katie. Forrest, I can understand because he definitely seems to be caught between being very emotional and having this tragedy in his life but trying to shut his emotions down and go with the Katie nihilism philosophy. Um, but definitely intrigued by her and Forrest specifically, just how they, how they balance these two views of life that really seem to contradict. Also, they say it's not powerful enough to predict that far back in time, which I think backs up the theory I had yesterday, which is that they're not truly viewing the past. They're calculating what the past was based on all the variables we have today is is my i think is why they use the word predict um agree with me yes so i was uh was right i think right. we can say there you go <laughs> and what do you think stewart was referring to when katie says you know don't break the rules and stewart says coming from her i have no idea it could be the place my mind went to immediately was, like we said, she is complicit in murder. Perhaps they know that. So they're like, who is she to talk to us about breaking the rules? I mean, they probably know Sergey was killed, right? Because all of a sudden he disappeared. They don't see him anymore. Yeah. I'm wondering if they're on the same level as Kitty and Forrest yet. In terms of humanity and emotion, it seems like they still have a little more humanity left in them. Right. Stuart definitely feels like he does. He talks about music all the time, and he really enjoys music. Music, man. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, so it could be the murder thing. It could be that she's done things in the past that will be revealed over time, where she's broken the rules. Maybe she's used the screen for personal for personal things in the past. I mean, who knows? Uh, so any other thoughts on what we saw in the box around the screen before we go to some of the other parts of the episode? No. We see uh, later in the episode, we do see a moment of Stuart and the kid kind of like rolling around on a chair and having a good time, <laughs> which uh, which I enjoyed. <laughs> I guess when you're cooped up in that box for a long time, you got to gotta just have some fun once in a while. Yeah, we all, we all have to take notes because I think a lot of us are going to be cooped up for a little while if we're self-quarantining from this whole corona thing. So, uh, alone, when we go home this weekend, let's grab a chair and just slide around. Yeah, we could use one of those, <laughs> one of those boxes. boxes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's go over to uh, the Lily side of the world in this episode. So, I don't think we need to go through this beat by beat. So, I'm just going to kind of overall summarize what we saw from, Lil from Lily and then we'll talk about it. So Lily goes to her supervisor to explain the situation. She tells her how she talked to somebody, you know, referring to Anton, the Russian. She says that what's going on here with Sergei, it's international. And as she's explaining this conspiracy to her supervisor, I'm watching it thinking she is terrible at explaining this. <laughs> she is making herself sound like a crazy person. And then Jen shows up and gets involved. Lily and Jen agree to go to Kenton, the security guy. And when they go to Kenton, Lily has a breakdown. She starts talking about how this is just like Brooklyn. I was seeing the Fibonacci sequence everywhere. <laughs> it's like my boyfriend's tattoo. It's the same thing. You think I'm crazy? Oh, my, oh, oh my God. <laughs> and then she basically has a, a breakdown and leaves the office while she's... Gone, Jen explains to Kenton, 
you know, she was hospitalized in the past. She has schizophrenia, blah, blah, blah. And then Kenton gets a call and realizes that Lily's standing on the edge of the building. And she's freaking out Forrest and the senator and all the other people that Forrest is with. So Kenton talks her down from the ledge. But while Kenton is out there, Jen gets on Kenton's computer and steals all the security footage. You look like you want to say something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, two things. One, why did Kenton probably leave his p- computer <laughs> unprotected? He just leaves it logged in. You know, he, he's, he knows he's got some incriminating stuff on there. Yep. I would just quickly hit that uh, lock lock computer button. Window key L. Yeah. Oh, oh, or Apple lock screen. What's it? It's I don't something know how like you that. lock your Apple computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then number two, why would Lily go right in front of the window, right in front of Kenton's office, where he at any moment he could easily just glance back in the window and see what Jen's up to? Well, it looked like it was some kind of a... It seemed like they were tinted windows, I thought. Because when they were outside, you really couldn't see through it. And maybe Lily and Jen knew that. Maybe I'm giving it too much credit, but that was my read on it. And they are very secretive about everything they do. You're giving me the most skeptical look in the world right now. Not (laughs) secret enough to quickly lock your computer before you leave the office. Let's be honest. Kenton, not that great. He's great at two things. One, he's great at sneaking. Okay, That's he true. snuck up on uh, Sergey. Anton. Oh, and Sergey. Snuck up on Anton. Yeah. He's a great sneaker, and he's a great neck breaker. <laughs> and he breaks necks in a way I've never seen he's before. He's not a great knife fighter. Not a great knife fighter. Well, he, got, he survived the knife fight, so he's just not great at security, which is his job. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then... When uh, Lily's plan here to well, let's get to, to get to the end of this, right? So they steal the footage. Lily brings the footage back to Jamie. They watch it and they find out that when Sergey lit himself on fire, the fire is clearly fake, and the whole thing was uh, was faked. It was uh, it was all visual effects. One amateur move. At least reverse the duplicated fire. Yeah, like if you watch, we've got some videos where we have to use fake fire. You can probably tell it's fake, but we definitely did not copy and then paste yeah. the fire twice, so it would be <laughs> duplicated. I, I, I expected a lot more from uh, like Forrest and Kenton, I'll be honest. Yeah. Yeah, especially I mean, Forrest must be a super genius based on the technology he's built. So it just seems like this whole plan should have been near impossible to get away with. Like when uh, when Lily made up the fact that she was hospitalized in the past and they kind of hand wave it away saying, there's no way they're going to find out. I mean, for all they know, you were hospitalized in Canada. So I guess they have no way of checking whether or not you were hospitalized in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> it all felt like it was way too easy mm-hmm. to get away with this plan. Yeah, I, w- I wanted to see Lily struggle struggle a lot more mentally to you know, get around them and make them work harder to figure out what she's up to. And I don't know. Is that they accomplished two things here. Number one, they got the security footage and got proof positive that there's some kind of a cover up with Sergey. Number two, they created this cover story that Lily's crazy and they no longer consider her a threat because now Kenton says, got nothing to worry about. If anything were to happen, Lily comes out and blows the whistle on us. All we got to do is say, she's nuts. So Lily and Jen pulled off the perfect heist here. And it just, like I said, felt way too easy. And Kenton and Forrest are apparently not very formidable foes. Uh, now, did you, did you buy Lily's plan? So for me, as I was watching the episode, I thought that they were actually telling us she's crazy. She was schizophrenic. And the whole time I'm thinking, wow, I've been really impressed with her, her acting, and she's terrible here. When she was acting crazy, I thought she's just not as great an actress as I thought. And I was thinking, 
do we really need a mental illness plot line thrown in here? And it also just comes off as absurd. You have this person who is apparently a paranoid schizophrenic, and now they're running into a truly, a true situation that warrants extreme paranoia. And then once it was revealed that it was all a big ruse, I thought, oh, thank God. Because this show, for me, dropped from like an 8 to a 5, and then went back up to a (laughs) (laughs) 7.3. So did you go on the same journey as me, or did you know from the get-go, this is all BS? I did not know it was BS. I thought either she was actually crazy, or that all that stuff actually did happen. I was leaning more toward the, it actually all did happen, and... That there there was something in the past that warranted paranoia. Yeah. So, but But I, I I like the outcome more than both of those. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, And then, like we said, we the the big reveal of the camera footage that the fire is fake. Not only that, then they actually give us a little flashback where they show Kenton and the other guards taking Sergey's body and lighting it on fire. And it was done in an interesting way where you see Sergei's body on fire and then they show the footage in reverse. The fire goes out. You see them pick up his body, pick up the lighter. So they basically showed us the process in reverse in case we didn't get it from the footage. They're saying, just so you don't doubt us, they did light him on fire. Proof. Which they could have just taken the footage when his body was on fire. So there was actual fire instead of putting in the fake fire. I don't know. Just <laughs> uh, whatever. <laughs> um, we didn't really talk much. And there wasn't a whole lot of it in the episode. But the senator who shows up to talk to Forrest. Again, you're making a face. Yeah. yeah. Since uh, you can't see Alon, I'll show you the face he made. <laughs> I don't know. The whole interaction between those two just seems kind of lame to me. I, I was not really interested in seeing any politics and like weird drama with the government and right. cover ups and this kind of stuff. Yeah, and basically to recap it, Senator shows up. She is putting a little bit of pressure on Forrest, saying that people like technology or no, people need technology. They need Facebook, Instagram, and all that. But they've started to hate technology companies. Facebook ruined our political process. Instagram has destroyed everyone's self-esteem, etc. Um, so as a senator, the government, we have a lot of leverage on you. The, the public will support us in whatever we want to do to you people. So we want to have some more oversight. Tell me what you're doing in devs. Forrest is reluctant, but eventually tells her we're creating algorithms that can predict she offers, oh, you mean like stocks and weather? He says something like that. And that satisfies her. He says, okay, stocks and weather. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I'm assuming they're planting seeds here. And this is going to be an important plot point over the next few episodes. Maybe when Lily gets some more evidence that her boyfriend was killed by Amia, by this company... Could she potentially work with the senator, work with the government? I don't know. Any thoughts on where this could be going? Or are you just totally, you're just, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see more of the sci-fi. Right. I want to see her get in that box and, mm. and learn some stuff. Yeah. It feels to me like a, a lot of the parts of the episode that you and I aren't finding as interesting wouldn't be here if this was a movie instead mm. of a miniseries. And that's what this episode felt like. It felt like padding. Like, did we really need to see all of this just to get to the point where we learn her boyfriend was murdered by them, Mm. which we knew already. And you mentioned there's only 10 episodes, right? Eight episodes. There's eight episodes planned. We don't even have a second season planned at this point. Most likely there won't be a second. This is being billed as a limited series. So there's no plan for it to continue beyond eight episodes. So I don't think there's enough episodes to have just a filler episode. Yeah, that's you don't need this episode. Mm -hmm. Right? With so few episodes, you don't need we can have true plot and character progression every episode. Now Overall, I'm still hooked. Mm -hmm. I want to see where things go, especially on the dev side. Every time we're back in the golden box and we see Stuart, I'm psyched. I want to see where it's going. I'm currently uninterested in Lily's story. I don't know where it's going from here. 
I mean, I know she's going to continue to investigate what's going on, but at the moment, I'm just not as invested as I was in the first two episodes. I'm hopeful that they'll be able to get me reinvested. This does feel like Netflix, all their Marvel shows, had this issue where they would start strong, there'd be a major dip in quality where the pacing slows down, and then it comes back and gets better towards the end as you get that momentum back where you're, you're working towards some kind of a conclusion. I have a feeling we're seeing a little bit of that here as well. But I'm hopeful it'll come back to the uh, same level of quality we saw in episode one. Mm-hmm. Any other uh, just thoughts on this episode? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just, Are you as optimistic as I am? Yeah, I, ha- I have a feeling. I, I still tr- What's his name? Alex Garland. Alex Garland. I still trust him. I still have a feeling I'm going to like where this all ends up. Um, maybe you're right. Maybe it's about the fact that this is his first TV show and the pacing's a little off. I still have faith that I'm going to end up really liking this show in the end. Yeah, agreed. And a few other things. So to say another positive thing about this episode, I think the score is still great. It, it creates such a feeling of uneasiness and discomfort. There was one particular moment I remember where the creepy talking that we hear from the chronovisor, which is what I'm going to call it, that's the conspiracy theory that the church, the Catholic church, has a machine called a chronovisor that allows you to look into the past, exactly like this machine. Yeah. So the creepy talking we heard on the chronovisor, at a certain point in the episode, in the score, we hear that creepy talking again. And so it just brings it right back to your mind. And I think they do a great job. And just to shout them out, that's Jeff Barrow and Ben Salisbury who are doing the score. They also scored Alex Garland's movie Annihilation, which also had a very effective score. So they're firing in all cylinders. Um, The senator's guard, the one who is jealous of Kenton, who is like, man, just once I'd like somebody to go after her so I have some excitement in my day. (laughs) And then at the end of the episode... When he sees everything Kenton went through and having to talk Lily off the ledge, he's like, man, you're so lucky. (laughs) Did you enjoy any of that stuff between them? Yeah, that was some fun banter. Yeah, some good comedic relief. I thought that worked. Uh, Another random thought. Um, Your favorite character, Stanley, right? Stuart. Stuart. (laughs) I'm thinking of The Office. (laughs) Stuart. I looked uh, looked up the actor. He's played by a guy named Stephen McKinley Henderson, and he's had an interesting career. Because his first movie was 1979, A Pleasure Doing Business. He played a bank teller. Huh. Second movie was six years later, 1985, uh, in a movie called Marie. He played Cooper's husband. That was 1985. His next movie, 2004, 19 years later, called Everyday People. Huh. So I'm very curious about that gap. I'll look into it for, uh, for our devs episode four. <laughs> <laughs> and I think... That pretty much covers it. Um, I guess with that, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit the like button. Actually, not if you enjoyed the episode. Even if you didn't enjoy this episode of Devs. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and make sure to hit the bell icon so you get notified whenever we do more videos like this one. Thanks for watching.